There we go. I just had to reboot it. Wouldn't it be great if we got a reboot in life? Yeah, I think we do a few, a few things differently. Hey, you know, great, God has done really some great things uh, in 2017. And that's kind of my message today. But when you think about it, uh, when God does great things, it brings great joy. So I'm hoping that today will be an uplifting day for you. When God does great things, it brings great joy. Think about it. When the shepherds made that great announcement to the shepherds and said, don't be afraid, I bring you good news, glad tidings of great joy. And then what, what happened? One of the greatest things in all time, the Savior was born. And that's supposed to bring to us great joy. All right? Well, even before that happened, there is a psalm, Psalm 126. It says, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. And that's what I want to happen today. I want us to be filled with joy because God has done some really great things. Now, as I look into the psalm, first thing I notice is it talks about when. Now, when you say when, you could say when Christmas comes next year, and I'm talking about the future. Or when I say, well, when Christmas happened last week, I'm talking about the past. When is a time word. It's always related to time, okay? When, it's telling us, and in this context, it says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion. Now, Zion is Jerusalem, okay? And that's where the sanctuary of the Lord was. And he says, when the Lord brought back captives to Zion, there was something that happened this, in the past that brought great joy. Now, first of all, to bring back to Zion meant you had to be taken out of Zion. This is the way it usually happens. Something really bad and terrible happens, and you're really down and out. And then God has to do something really great. And then you say, wow, hasn't the Lord done something really fantastic? And that brings the joy. Life is like that, back and forth, up and down, up and down, up and down. And I don't know, maybe this holiday season was the up season for you. Maybe it was the down season. I don't know which way it went. What he's talking about here is, in the year 605 B.C., the Babylonians came to Jerusalem and they conquered the city. They gathered up all the young people that were of nobility and had any education, and they carried them back into Babylon. The rest, and they were given prominent positions as they were trained in all the ways of the Babylonians, but the rest of them were mostly in servitude in Babylon. For 70 years, they served in Babylon, until finally... God, under Cyrus, had the people return back to their homeland of Jerusalem. When the Lord brought back the captives, listen to what it says, we were like men who dreamed. We were like men who dreamed. We were like men who dreamed. I don't know, the church is uh, not, I mean, we're going to be soon 100 years old, so to figure that, hey, you had 70 bad years, whoa, that would mean that uh, it had been a long time we'd had bad times. But that's not to say the church hasn't gone through some difficult times. Is that not right? There were a few times people scratched their head and said, should we even continue as a church, right? Well, we were on some difficult times, but the Lord has brought back some good times, and we were like men who dreamed. Now, when I think of like men who dreamed, I think of Jacob in chapter 28 of the book of Genesis. And Jacob was fleeing uh, uh, from his, his, his brother Esau, who wanted to kill him because he stole his birthright. You remember that story? And he stopped at a place called Luz, and he used, he used a rock for his pillow. Now, that would probably make you dream something, okay? Uh, at least give you a stiff neck. Anyway, he's on this rock, and he's sleeping. And in this dream, there is a staircase that goes to heaven, and at the top is God, and up and down is the angels, and God does something there. He confirms the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant made with his father, he confirms it with him, and God says, I am going to bless you. Isn't that a great dream? I think it's good to have dreams. Dreams that are positive. Listen, I have a dream that Bethany would become a Jesus-built church. And you say, well, what does that mean to be a Jesus-built church? Well, Jesus said this, that the church should be built on the great confession. He took a turn to, to Peter after he asked the others, who do men say that I am? And they said a couple of people, and then he said, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. I have a dream that we are a church that is built upon the great confession that Jesus is the Christ. Why do I have this as a dream? Because Jesus is in the build it business of building the church. When we have the great confession as our bedrock, the church will grow and prosper. Because Jesus, his reputation is at stake. He said, I will build my church. Now you and I both know that it's not this building. This building is not the church. We the people sitting here, we are the church. And when we have the great confession of our faith, and I'm building my life on it, He, God, Jesus, will build in me. You want to know something? When He does that, that brings great joy. That brings great joy. My, my desire is, uh, is to see this. This is my dream. That we will become a church of the great confession that unbelievers will come to faith in Jesus here at Bethany. They will get baptized, they'll join the church, and they in turn will go out and tell other people the joyous message of salvation that they too can come to faith and that they can be baptized and join the church and Jesus will build this church. The second part of, the, of this dream that I have of a Jesus-built church is simply this. The great commandment. Jesus said that you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the great commandment, to love the Lord God with all your heart. And the second commandment is like unto the first, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what happens in this church. We become a people who not only love God, we love other people. We become compassionate and compassionate concern for people. We become the great Samaritans in our culture. We reach out and touch people's lives. Even like a, a, a guy by the name of Kevin who is a homeless guy and there's somebody's heart here who is so exercised to say, I care about this man because he's homeless and he's outside in the bitter cold. The love of the Lord flows through me as a Jesus built church. The third part is the Great Commission. That we reach people, not just here in our community, but around the world at the same time, that we have an international missionary influence in the world. That's my dream. Because such a church as this, Jesus will build. I also have a dream that people will become a Bible people. They'll know their Bibles. So this past year, this past year, we passed out back in January, it's like the first, all right, the first of the year, we pass out a Bible reading schedule. And how many people remember when I pass those out? Some of you have forgotten that I passed those out. Okay. <laughs> all right. How many started reading their Bible? How many got a certain portion of the way into the Bible? How many made it all the way through? All those that raise their hand right now, come up front, come up front. Oh, let's give these people a hand. Come on, everybody raised, everybody made it all the way through the Bible. John, you're, <coughs> he didn't finish, but his mother did. Anna did. Come on, John, you're, you're going you're gonna, to, I have an award for every one of you. Yes, yes, yes. These are Bethany pens, and you earn these from reading through your Bible in one year. Uh, any of you got to still read it today just to finish it? Well, I do it, but I'd have to read a lot. <laughs> I got bogged down. Hey, let's give them a hand, okay? Is this great? They read through the entire Bible in one year. And John, John you were supposed to come up here. You give this to your mom, I know, because every time I visit her, she tells me where she's at in the Bible, and often she has questions. Anybody who's read through the Bible have a question? Have you read a little bit and say, I'm not quite getting this. If you've been in the Revelation or Daniel, Zechariah, you, know, some, you probably have a question, all right? But, but that's the whole thing. But one of the things I notice about the people who read through the Bible, this is what they say to me. The first time I read through the Bible, I said this to you. Why didn't they tell me all this in church? And the answer is, you wouldn't sit there and listen to me tell you everything that's in the Bible. You got to get in it and do it yourself. See, I want us, Bethany, to be a Bible-based church so that we are on the bedrock of the Word of God and not 
pop psychology of band, politics, all that other junk that we are able to do that most repeated phrase in the Bible, thus says the Lord. We are people of God. Focus on the Word of God. And I want us to be a people of prayer. Prayer. You may not know this, but every other week, well, the second and the fourth week of every month, the deacons gather together and we pray for every prayer request that the church has. We, we collect it. And then the ones that we don't have, we start piling on and we add them. And we pray. We have a long prayer meeting. There's other groups that pray. The men's group prays on Monday nights, okay? And the, and the ladies' groups pray. And uh, then I, we introduce this thing called a concert of prayer. And we've had two of them so far. Everybody attend the concert of prayer? These are awesome times. We're for just a half hour, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Pray. Pray. Because you see, it's a two-way communication. God speaks to us through the Bible. I speak to God through prayer. And I have a relationship with the true and living God that I've made the great confession about and I'm doing the great commandment because I have a living, dynamic relationship with the true and living God. And so it's been my dream that we will be a people of the book and a people of prayer. You notice this also. That in the past, joy made them laugh. They laughed. Pastor, I laughed. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Let me tell you something. We've had some laughter here this last year. Uh, there have been some uh, Bethany moments that have caused us to laugh. Right, come on. When was the last time you knew of an 80-year-old person jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, huh? We gave a Bethany pen. We're jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. All right. Or, or how about Old Fashioned Day? We gave out a couple Bethany pens for Old Fashioned Day, huh? Was that a great time? An awesome time. Hey, we, we, moments of laughter. Uh, how about uh, for Monday Night Football? Yeah. Well, watching the game through your eyelids. All right? I mean, have we laughed? We've had a great time. Or somebody getting a birthday suit. Yeah, I, I've not really been brave enough to wear it on a Sunday morning. But some of you have seen me around here wearing it as we've done other activities. Yeah. We've had... And I got a Bethany pen given to me for that, and I got another one for being the only person who couldn't turn off the, the alarm and setting it off and couldn't turn it off. And, and, but we've had great times of laughter and fun. And you know, there's been one person, every time I talk about Bethany pens, that they say, how can I get a Bethany pen? Lily, come on up here. Come on up. Come on up. Every single time I give one, she says to me, how can I get a Bethany pen? Well, you're getting a Bethany pen for persistence. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. God bless you. All right. Our mouths will, were filled with laughter. With laughter. The Bible says laughter is good medicine. It does something for you. And we need to laugh. We need to have those moments. But he says, when, when God does great things, it brings great joy, and that joy makes me laugh. He says, and our tongues, he says, our tongues with songs of joy. He says, our mouths were filled with laughter, and our tongues were filled with songs of joy. I am so glad that God brought to us David Deco and his wife Heidi. Oh. We are so blessed so blessed he fills our tongues with songs of joy so that we can sing unto the Lord and so the Bible says he has put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our God many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord the more dynamic our music ministry is and the more we sing the joy of the Lord more people will be attracted to this place and want to come back. People want to laugh. People want to have joy. People want to sing. Even if it's like me, only in the shower. <laughs> you haven't heard me sing. Every now and then, uh, they leave my microphone on and I join them as they sing. And uh, it doesn't sound so good. Uh, hey. 
this this passage he's, he's, he's talking about past joy not just great things it brings joy that testify then it was said among the nations listen other people hear about it and know I see it's my dream that Bethany will have that testimony that God is doing great things here and other people will hear about it and they will say the Lord has done great things for them Isn't that what you want to hear God is at work at Bethany God is doing great things we got this old hymn to God be the glory great things he has done I'm gonna tell you something God has done great things we started this year of 2017 we we're on the very last day of it the very first day of it we started a series called getting the most out of church we did a little study of uh, first Timothy we had our first concert of prayer in January in February the men got together and did a Bible study God did some great things there. He built us up as men, a band of brothers, as we studied Romans chapter 12. In March, we had Ash Wednesday service, where some of us made commitments on Ash Wednesday to show before the Lord that we could give up something for Him, and then through the whole Lent season. In April, we invited the goods to come and be on our platform share their vision, their, their concern for hungry. Now fast forward, in October, uh, we commissioned them and we took them on for financial support. In November, okay, just a month ago, they arrived in Hungary and right now they're in Hungary anticipating a new year. And, and they're in language school learning the Hungarian language and of course the kids are catching on faster than they are. It's my dream. For Bethany, the international influence. This is the start. I have a dream in the year 2019. We will have a group of people who go on a mission trip to Hungary to see what they're doing there and support them and do ministry in Hungary at least for a week. It's a dream. Start saving your money now. That was followed up in April with our first agape feast. We'll probably do that again. It was an awesome time where we all shared a love feast, which was followed by uh, then a Good Friday service and then Easter Sunday. And we had our largest attendance here at Bethany since I've been pastor here on Easter Sunday morning. And I anticipate the same in 2018, even more. We invited a youth group to come and minister to us. Now, wasn't this a great time when this youth group had the whole praise band and they, they ministered to us from the Solid Rock Church? And then Mother's Day. Some of you are still carrying around the pen. I may still have the pen. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. Tell you what, I like that pen. It really writes well. I mean, I tell you what, it doesn't skip or anything. It doesn't leak. That's one good pen. We, we talked about the prayer of Jabez. Uh, about a mother and her, her son in that case. Mother and child. Right? We did a summer series on the fruit of the Spirit. Remember we have four chairs up here? I may remember four chairs. Yeah, the four chairs. Okay. I don't remember anything else. But you remember there were four chairs up there? <laughs> All right. Same here. Okay. Uh, we had invited the entire church. Talk about great things. It was a terrible rainy day. But we invited the entire church to come to our house for a picnic. And I and I didn't know what we were going to do. We had a tent set up outside. But in, we were afraid it was all going to have to be inside. You know, we got a tiny house. And, and so anyway, God stopped the rain. Isn't that great? And we had an awesome, great time. We had a good group of kids go to uh, Area 51, to Cedar Point. How many went to Cedar Point? All right, I see your hands. Yes, 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 we had a great time. Then came the month of July. We had Old Fashioned Day. Old Fashioned Day. And on Old Fashioned Day, we had Old Fashioned Picnic. God, this is really cool things. We had Old Fashioned Fencing. We had Old Fashioned Picnic. We had everything was really, it came Old Fashioned. Anybody remember what I was wearing? Green leisure suit. I didn't put it up there. In July, we had our midsummer celebration. Wasn't that great? We had a concert, a mini concert here at the church in the end of July. In the fall, I had been doing my Bible reading until I got to Joshua, and I got hung up in Joshua. I started studying it rather than reading it. That's what happens to a preacher. It's hard for a preacher to do any book without saying, I got to study this. So I didn't get, to, I actually got through Judges and Ruth, but then I said, man, that, I got to go back and study that Joshua. And now that came a sermon series, I think it was my favorite that I had 
know, I've done I mean, in my years of ministry. It was just an awesome time. We had three Sunday nights in September where we got together and we studied in adult Bible education. We're going to do three Sunday afternoons in February of, of 2018, and they're going to be in the afternoon. The ladies did the study of the armor of God. We had the pasties. Was that a great time? Listen, God did great things. We had a craft fair here, and as a result of that craft fair, we're going to be picking up our next new member, already been voted upon, just been away, and, and as soon as they get back, we're going to extend right hand to fellowship, so we already know we're going to have one new member in the year 2018. What a great start, huh? We had spectacular Sunday, both in November and December, and we distributed the food. We had, what a great thing, the reverse advent calendar and the glove drive, the coat rack, all of that, to, to reach those in our community. This. We had a painting party for the youth. 16. 16 teenagers. Here's Bethany. Painting. Isn't this awesome? God has done great things in 2017. And these are things that every we should be broadcasting. We, we know that God's done these things. That's what he's done in the past. And he says, what God has done in the past should give us a present joy. The Lord has done, done great things in the past, and He has filled us with joy. He's filled us with joy. I'm excited about what God has done at Bethany. I am excited. He says then, he kind of turns it to a prayer. In the present, he says, God, restore. So he says, restore our fortunes. Look at this old car. This is the way some people will come into church. This is the way some people's lives they feel when they come. They come, and, and then when they find Christ, it's like, woo. I, I, I've been totally restored. My life is so much better. He says, oh Lord, like streams in the Negev. The Negev is a desert. And then they come across the stream. He says, refresh us, oh Lord. This is our present joy. When we know that God has done great things, we say to ourselves, because God has done this in the past, He can do it in the future. He can do better things. He can restore my soul, and He can refresh me within that's my present reality. I don't live in the past, but I leverage the past so that my present, no matter what my circumstance is, I know that God can do better than He's ever done in the past if I just rely upon Him. Which leads us to the future joy. The psalm has it all. Past joy, present joy, future joy. In the future joy, he says, will, will. The term will is a future tense. And he's saying in the future, he gives us this future joy principle. Those who sow in tears, they will reap with songs of joy. He backed that up. He says, hey, I'm sowing with tears. And he says, I reap with joy. As I look at this passage, he says, in the future joy, there's a price emotionally. Before you can have the joy, he says, he who goes out weeping. This person is, is, he's sowing, he's carrying the seed, and he's weeping. This is hard work. Not only is it emotionally distressing for him, it, it is physically distressing. He's carrying a load, a burden of seed. He's going out, and he says, your future joy. we got an expression that goes like this. No pain, no gain. That's what he's saying. They didn't say it that way back then. Well, what he's saying is, listen, you go out weeping. There's your pain. You go out carrying the seed. There, there's, there's the pain. There's the exercise. There's the physical thing. He says the future joy is going to cost something. But he says it's going to be a future joy that's going to give you a return. He goes out. Listen, he says he will return. You see that? There's a movement. You go out. You come back. You don't sit on your duck. I commend these people who have read through their Bible in a year. Because every day they went out into the Word, and then they came back with the blessing. Every day they go get something from the Word, and they come back with the blessing. Every day they go get something from the Word. Prayer the same way. Every day I go to the prayer and Lord, ask the Lord for something, he, he gives me something. If I don't do that, no pain, no gain. Listen, you go out, you return. You go out, you return. Future joy. He says you go out weeping. You take all your emotional distresses, all your problems, all of these things. 
Peter says, cast all your care upon him. What is it that's got you emotionally distressed, got you down, got you depressed, uh, got you burdened? What, what is that thing? You take it before the Lord. You go out, he says, you go, you go out weeping, you take it before the Lord, and you will return to songs of joy. Do you see that? That's a promise. You will return. You will return. God is in the business of taking what we have messed up and fixing it. It all goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 20, uh, Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve fell into sin. Boom. What did God do? He prepared coats to hide from them. To prepare the coats, skin coats, he sacrificed a substitute to cover for them so that they could receive, so that God could fix the mess they made. I'm telling you what, from Genesis chapter 3 to the end of the book of the Revelation, the book is about we mess up and when we come to the Lord, nutrition in our heart, confession, weeping. called salvation. It's called redemption. God is in the business of saving. He said, we went out with weeping and we returned with songs of joy. We went out carrying seeds, but watch what he said. I come back carrying sheep. I went out with a little and God blessed me with a lot. When I take a little to the Lord, you know, and here's, the, here's the thing, it blows me away all the time. I pray for something and God does something. I said, wow, I can't believe he did it. You ever said it? I can't believe. Well, wait, I thought you prayed for it. Hey, didn't you pray for that? Didn't you believe when you prayed? So verse it goes like this. God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ever think or ask. Whatever he's doing in your life, it's more than you thought or asked of him. There's not much going on in my life by God. Maybe it's because I have not sown the seed so that I can bring back the sheaves. Now the sheaves have multiple, thousands and thousands of seeds. So I go out and sow a few seeds and I come back with a lot. Listen, the apostle Paul uses this for the financial giving to the church. He said this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly, whoever puts a little in the plate, will reap sparingly. You'll only get a little bit back. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. Whoever sows generously, now he's not talking about you got to take. It's not how much you give. Remember the, the, the Jesus was in the temple and there's the, the widow. He saw the widow come in. And the widow came, and there were these guys pouring in their money. The collection receptacles were like trumpets. They were a funnel that came up. And you've seen them in the malls where you put your coin in it and go, clink. That's what the money was. They'd bring their coins in and they go, Boop. and they weren't perfectly round, so they go, and then they go spinning around and drop in, and they made a lot of noise. And so everybody was giving attention, because here's a guy, man, he's got like a wheelbarrow, he's pouring it in there, and everybody's giving him the attention. You see, wow, this guy, he's giving a lot to God, you know? Ooh, he must be really somebody. And everybody notices him, but Jesus' eyes are fixed on a woman who pulls out what would be considered like two pennies, two cents. She drops it in the collection. Jesus tells the disciples, has given more than all of them. Because they gave out of their abundance. They still had a lot. But she gave her last three. It really had nothing to do with the amount. God owns everything. He should lend it to you. God owns everything. It has everything to do with our heart. When I so generously, I give what I give and I want to give to him. I said, when you sow generously like that, you reap generously back from God. 
Oh, nice it. Right. Yeah, I'm one of those, and I learned at an early age. I can't afford not to do it. You know what I mean? I need his blessing. I need him to multiply my nine tenths because I've given him one tenth. He's blessed me my whole life. I know that it works. You so generously. Now Jesus takes us in another direction. This is about harvesting, harvesting. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. He was preaching everywhere. And when he saw the crowds, people, he had compassion on them. I stopped. Well, we were, we've been to the mall a few times shopping. We've been to Costco shopping. We've been, we've been to all different stores shopping. And uh, we're shopping. I, I stop after a while. I get tired of shopping. And I just kind of watch that people watch and watch. Even in the celebrated time of Christmas, I, I, I've noticed so many empty, empty hearts, empty lives, empty people. They may have their baskets full, but you read their faces. They're empty. Jesus saw the crowds. Watch what he said. He had compassion on them. It moved him inwardly. Because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep. Had no shepherd. So they're just wandering astray. They're wandering all over the place. They, they don't know where they're going, what they're doing, what their purpose is, why they're here, why they're on planet Earth. What is my purpose in life? They have no, no purpose. Aimlessly wandering sheep. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Look at it. These people, the people are the harvest. But the workers are here. The workers are here. Ask the Lord of harvest, that's God the Father, to send out workers into his harvest field. Oh, we need more people at Bethany who got a heart and a passion to reach out to other people who are wandering with aimlessly through this world, have no purpose, no direction, don't know why they're here, where they're going. They're just stumbling along through life. We need more people to tell them, Jesus is the way to joy, happiness, success, prosperity, blessing, place in heaven, forgiveness of sins. Oh my goodness, the list goes on and on. They have none of that. The harvest is do not say that there are four more months and then is the harvest. Yeah, when you sow, you got to wait for it to grow. Jesus said, "What? Well, you don't even have to sow for the need. The need is out there." I tell you, open your eyes and look. Look at people. Look at the field. Look at the field. They are right. Time to bring them to Jesus. It's time to bring them to the city. It's time to bring them to church. It's time to bring them to the city. It's time. It's time. It's time. So I say, Bethany, open your eyes and look at 2018. It's right to the harvest. It's right to the harvest. Of all the great things God has done in 2017 here at Bethany, I think 2018 is so ripe for harvest for God to do something great here at Bethany among the people of God in this church. It's time for our joy. Because when God does great things, it's great, great joy. I look so forward to 2018. God is going to do some great things for His great name. And we will have, we will reap, we will reap the joy from it. Father in heaven, how we thank you for everything you've done in our lives here in 2017. For the people who have accepted Christ, been baptized, joined the church, 
uh, Lord, for the growth that we have seen, uh, for all the fun that we've had, for the Bethany pins that have gone out. We thank you, Lord, for the songs we have sung, for bringing David and Heidi to us. Lord, to lead us in worship and that we might get the joy of the Lord in our soul, that it might carry us through the week when, when perhaps nothing else has, that some melody or tune, some words, some lyrics might carry us through the week. Now, Father, we're thankful for the Word of God and the things we've been able to study. We're thankful, Lord, that it is for joy. You want us to be a joyful people. We sang joy to the world and, and that the, the Christ has come. And, and when we reflect upon what you've done in the past, it brings us present joy and we anticipate, Lord, the sowing principle. We'll sow and we will reap. 2018, we want to harvest, Lord. Bless so that Bethany grows as Jesus builds his church. Use the likes of us, we pray, O oh Lord. We pray, Father, we'll touch someone else's life, our neighbor, a friend, a co-worker. And we'll just do that simple, the simplest of, of ways to reach them. Just say, come and see what God is doing at that. Lord, we'll, we'll declare the salvation that's in Christ, that they too might believe and have the joy of the Lord. Restore your joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.